Hello, thank you for joining us today for our Sunday School Lesson Study. Let us begin with prayer. Our Father in heaven, we come today to thank you for another day that you have made. We thank you, Father, that you have watched over us as we slumber and as we slept, and that you have gotten us up to morn this morning and given us a heart and a mind to praise and to glorify you as we study your holy word. We thank you, Father, for this church, the greatest shallow missionary Baptist church. We thank you for each and every member. We thank you, Father, for those that are in positions of leadership and stewardship. We pray, Father, for your continued blessings upon this church and that we may become the kind of individuals that you have called us to be, and that is Christ-centered individuals that praise and glorify you and honor God. We thank you, Father, for your darling son, Jesus. We thank you for his life, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. We pray now, Father, that you would guide us through this lesson steady, that you would give us wisdom and understanding, Father, to apply these truths into our daily lives. We thank you, Father, for our neighborhood, for our county, for our city, for our communities, Father, we thank you for this state and for this nation. We pray now, Father, for those that are sick and afflicted among us, for those that are suffering from the loss of some loved ones, for those that are downtrodden and confused and dealing with the many issues that they see in and around their world, the potential for the potential for the return of the global pandemic, the rise in the flu and all of the other kinds of illness that we see. We pray, Father, that you will continue to guide us as a church. Help us, Father, to know and to understand and to apply your truths in our daily lives. Help us, Father, to hold on to the faith that we have in Jesus, for Jesus truly is the Son of God. And help us, Father, to glorify and honor him. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Again, I thank you for joining us for today's study. As we look at the screen on our agenda, we see that we are beginning a new quarterly study, which has to do with the winter 2023 quarterly topic of faith that pleases God. And we begin a new unit, which is unit two series of lessons, which is learning about faith. As we look at our January 7th, 2024, Lesson 6, which has to do with faith and righteousness, as we study from several uh, verses in the book of Hebrews, beginning with Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 4a, chapter 7a, I'm sorry, verses 7a, verse 8, verses 17 through 18, verses 20 through 23, verse 32, and verses 39 through 40 of the New International Version of the Bible. And so we see our agenda for today's study, which is the January 7th, 2024, uh, lesson number six. Uh, and we see that we have three teaching outlines for today's study. Our first outline is faith explained from Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 4a. Our second outline is faith lived out from Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7a, verse 8, verse 17 through 18, verses 20 through 23, verse 32, and our third outline has to do with promises because of faith from Hebrews chapter 11, verses 39 through 40 of the New International Version of the Bible. And so that brings us to our lesson scripture for today's study, which is uh, on our screen. Uh, and we'll see beginning at Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 4a we find faith in action. And so let's read our first uh, part of the scripture, beginning at verse one. Now faith 
is the confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed by God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. And now in verse 7a, we see that by faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. And so in verses 11, uh, in, in verse 8 and 17 through 18, we see this, this uh, part of our scripture. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He would have embraced the, he who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son. Even though God has said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. And so in verses 20 through 23, we see that by faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and worshiped as he learned or leaned on the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions concerning the burial of his bones. By faith, Moses hid him, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born, because they saw he was no ordinary child, and they were not afraid of the king's edict. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets. These were all commended in verses 39 through 40. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. Since God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. And so this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be unto God. And so we see next on our screen, as we look at our lesson context for today, uh, and so let's read our lesson context, which is on the screen. And so let's look at that together. Uh, from... Uh, uh, our winter 2024 lesson six context, which has to do with our study for the day, which is faith and righteousness. And so let's read our lesson context together, which is on our screen. God has proven himself trustworthy. We may desire to do something that our limited vision tells us is edifying and appropriate. But if we are listening to our God and trusting his voice about all else, above all else, we may discover otherwise. When reading scripture, it's always a good idea to know the purpose for which it was written. The natural approach is to look for a clear purpose statement such as in Luke's gospel, chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, and John's gospel, chapter 20, verse 30 through 31, which I quote in verse 30 and 31. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, 
and that by believing you may have life in his name. And so the book of Hebrews, however, has no such purpose statement. So the book of Hebrews' purpose must be inferred from its contents. The extended comparison and contrast of Jesus with Old Testament personalities, the Levitical priesthood, angels, etc., signify the purpose of being to encourage wavering and persecuted Christians of Jewish background to stand firm in Christ and not retreat into Judaism. Beyond this relative certain conclusion, there is no consensus about who wrote the book of Hebrews or when. Regarding the date of writing, we have some clear certainty that the book cannot have been written after A.D. 96 because Clement of Rome seems to quote from Hebrews up to four times while writing his epistle to the Christian Corinthian church. The book of Hebrews also discusses the worship within the temple as though the Jewish temple was still in existence. So the day prior to the temple's destruction in A.D. 70 is likely. Questions of authorship, date, and provenance aside, what is clear from the content of the book of Hebrews is that the addressees were in danger of giving up due to their suffering and having faith in Christ from Hebrews chapter 10 verses 32 through 39. In Hebrews chapter 11 begins immediately after the danger of giving up due to their suffering for having faith in Christ is addressed. And so that brings us to our lesson study for today, uh, which is uh, on our screen. And so let's look at our lesson study. And our first outline has to deal with faith explained in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 4a. And so our first Subtopic has to do with what is the definition of faith as we look at verses 1 and 2, which are on our screen. And so let's read verses 1 and 2 together. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. And so we see in verse 1, that words translated as faith, faithful, and faithfulness occur some 316 times in the ancient New Testament manuscripts. 37 occurrence of these words in the New Testament comprise almost 12% of the 316. Hebrews constitute only about 3.6% of the New Testament. And so the subject of faith is vital to the author of Hebrews. Thus his offer of the definition of faith in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1. A key to understanding uh, what the writer of Hebrews intended is the word translated confidence. The writer of Hebrews emphasizes faith as the appropriate response to the eternal rewards God has promised his people. Hope and confidence are also connected in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 6. Assurance is to be understood in the sense of verification or certain persuasion. The phrase, what we do not see, more precisely describes the desired result of our hope. The faithful believers, the, which are called Christians, ultimate hope is not in anything in the present visible world, as we see in John chapter 17, verse 16, James chapter 4, verse 4, and 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. Our hope is in the unseen, eternal reality yet to become, as Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 
chapter 4, verse 18. Belief and faith are closely related, but faith is the stronger of the two com uh, concepts, as James points out in James chapter 2, verse 19. Now, in verse 2 of today's study, the ancients of the Old Testament are the Old Testament faithful. And the word this refers to their faith being defined in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. God is the one who commended them for their faith, which is translated as spoken well of in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4b. The writer of the book of Hebrews both begins and ends with what has come to be called the hall of faith, as we will see in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 39. And so our next subtopic has to do with foundations as we look at verses 3 and 4a, which are on the screen. And so let's read verses 3 through 4a together. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. And so in verse 3, we see that faith is necessary to understand things that are not real but cannot be observed, such as God creating the entire universe. This is not blind faith, which is a belief in something without evidence to support that belief. We are talking about faith based on evidence. Since the evidence of God's holy character and limited power has been established many times over, we can trust that his account of the creation of the cosmos, which, has, which was unseen by humans, is true. And so that's faith based on evidence, not blind faith, as John would write in John chapter 20, verse 30 through 31. Now in verse 4a, this is found in Genesis concerning Abel. Abel brought the best of his flock, while Cain brought some of the fruit of the soil, as we see in Genesis chapter 4, verse 3. God's favor on Abel was, and not Cain, was uh, because Abel brought the best of his uh, offering, not keeping it for himself. As a result, Abel is known as the righteous Abel, as we see in Matthew Gospel, chapter 23, verse 35. While Cain, who murdered his brother Abel in Genesis chapter 4, verse 8, is infamous as a negative example, which we read in 1 John chapter 3, verse 12, as well as Jude, uh, verse 11. And so our second outline has to do with how we live out our faith. As we read from Hebrews chapter, chapter 11, verses 7a, verse 8, verse 17 through 18, verses 20 through 23, and verse 32. And so let's read our first subtopic, which has to do with another one of the Hall of Faith members, uh, as we read verse 7a. By faith Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. And so in verse 7a, Noah's account is found in Genesis chapters 6 through 9. Building an ark was no small exercise in faith. The phrase that things not yet seen is connected with our topic for today in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, which is the definition of faith. Thus, Noah's faith was based on the word of God concerning the flood which Noah had not yet been able to see. A holy fear of God that directs our actions, our speech, and thoughts is an appropriate response today as it was for Noah. Jesus said, Fear him who, after your body has been killed, has authority to throw you into hell. 
Yes, I tell you, fear him from Luke's Gospel, chapter 12, verse 5. And so our next subtopic is a topic that has to do with another one of the members of the Hall of Faith in Abraham. As we look at verses 8 and verses 17 through 18. And so let's read verses 8 and verse 17 through 18, which is on our screen. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac, his only son, as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son. Even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offsprings will be reckoned. And so we see the call of Abraham in verse 8. It's found in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3 with Abraham's walk of faith recorded from the book of Genesis chapter 12, verse 4, through chapter 25, verse 11. We can also compare Acts chapter 7, verse 1 through 7, as Stephen speaks to the Sanhedrin council. Abraham trusted the unseen, invisible God, rather than the visible, fictitious gods or the idol gods of the Chaldeans, which was from his culture. And he did so as he departed for an unknown land several hundred miles distant. Considering that Abraham was the man who believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, it is certainly fitting that Abraham is included in what is called the list of hall of faith. That doesn't mean that Abraham never sinned, which we see he did in Genesis chapter 16, verses 3 and 4. Also in chapter Genesis chapter 12, verses 12 through 13, as well as Genesis chapter 20, verse 2. As we consider the faith walk of several members of the hall of faith, we will remind ourselves this, that they were not without flaws because the Bible also tells us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so now we look at another one of the members of the hall of faith as we look at Isaac in verse 20. And so let's read verse 20 together, which is on our screen. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. Uh, so we see now in verse 20 that Isaac was born in about 2067 BC. He grew up to become the father of Jacob and Esau, which was twins that was born in about 2007 BC. Isaac, like his father Abraham, was something of a mixed bag of character traits. Isaac obeyed God by faith, as we see in Genesis chapter 26, verses 1 through 6, which is the original text. But Isaac also adopted his father's practice of deception in Genesis chapter 27, verse 7. Isaac was also guilty of the parental error of favoritism in Genesis chapter 25, verse 28. Now, God sometimes uses people in his service despite themselves because God is sovereign and he can do whatever he wants to do whenever he gets ready to do it with whomever he wants to. And so Jacob and Esau were born to Isaac and his wife, Rebekah. The family wrestled with the sin of deceit and favoritism, as we see in Genesis chapter 25, verse 28, and chapter 26, verse 7. And so when it appeared that God's plan might be in danger as a result of these situations that deal with these people that are flawed, the writer of the book of Hebrews reminds us that God was still at work. Isaac blessed his 
sons, Jacob and Esau. And he was looking forward to how God used them in his plan of salvation for the world. As we see in Genesis chapter 27, verses 27 through 40. And so Jacob is mentioned before Esau because it was assumed that through the lineage of Jacob that the promise would be fulfilled in Christ. And so now we look at Jacob in verse 21, another member of the Hall of Faith that recorded in the book of Hebrews chapter 11. And so let's read verse 21 together. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and worshiped as he leaned on the top of his staff. And so we see in verse 21, uh, that Hebrews chapter 11, verse 21, is derived from Genesis chapter 47, verse 31, where we uh, find the account of Jacob and, and his sons, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, Isaac and his sons, Jacob and Esau. And so when Jacob blessed each of Joseph's sons, he essentially adopted them as his own sons. As a result, two of the 12 tribes of Israel descended from the tribe of Ephraim and Manasseh, which was Joseph's son, in Joshua chapter 14, verse 4. And so Jacob's faith here is evidenced by his worship of God, which he continued to do until, his, until he died, all the way up until on his deathbed. Jacob's sins, though, also involve deception in Genesis chapter 27, verses 18 through 24, as well as manipulation in Genesis chapter 25, verses 29 through 33, also in Genesis chapter 30, verses 37 through 43, and favoritism in Genesis chapter 37, verses 3 and 4. But the Lord used Jacob in service for himself, nevertheless. In other words, even though these so-called uh, faithful people that's listed in the book of Hebrews chapter 8, I'm sorry, chapter 11, which is called the Hall of Faith, they were not faultless, but God nevertheless used them in his perfect plan to bring about salvation to the world. And so next we look at verse 22 which has to deal with Joseph. And so let's read verse 22, which is on our screen. <coughs> Excuse me. By faith, Joseph, when his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions concerning the burial of his bones. And so we see in verse 22, that in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 23, it reiterates, from, it reiterates what is said in Genesis chapter 50, verses 24 through 26. About 1899 B.C., Joseph's brother sold him to the Ishmaelites when Joseph was about 17 years old. In turn, the Ishmaelites sold Joseph into Egyptian slavery in Genesis chapter 37, verse 2, and verse 28. At the age of 30, Joseph had been appointed second in command in Egypt in that he became the prime minister of Egypt in Genesis chapter 41, verse 46. Facing numerous challenges to his faith in the intervening years, the phrase the Israelites translate more literally as the children of Israel in the King James Version of the Bible. We may think of Israel as the organized nation. It would become 430 years later after the Exodus in Exodus chapter 12, verse 40 through 41. But Israel really refers specifically to Joseph's father, Jacob, whose name had been changed from Jacob to Israel who had his name changed to Israel by God in Genesis chapter 32, verse 28, and Genesis chapter 35, verse 10, as well as Genesis chapter 46, verse 8. Thus, speaking of Jacob's family, 
rather than a fully formed nation. In other words, this particular verse is talking about the family of Jacob and how it, the, they are fulfilled God's promise that he made through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so these instructions were rooted in God's promise made to his father Jacob, his grandfather Isaac, and great-grandfather Abraham concerning that they would possess the land of Canaan in Genesis chapter 15, verse 7, in Genesis chapter 48, verse 30, uh, verse 3 and 4, and in Exodus chapter 6, verse 8, and so forth. And so next we look at Amram and Jochebed in verse 23. And so let's look on our screen and read our verse 23. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was not a, no ordinary child. In other words, they saw he was no ordinary child, and they were not afraid of the king's edict. And so in verse 23, we see that Hebrews chapter 11, verse 23 treats the lives of Abraham and Moses as journeys of faith. Abraham and Moses are prominent figures presented in the Israelites' journey of faith. The faith of Moses' parents is at discussion here, not the faith of Moses himself. Moses' parents are named Amram and Jochebed in Exodus chapter 6, verse 20. The phrase, no ordinary child, means beautiful. It may carry the sense that Moses' parents had an awareness that the child Moses would grow to be someone special in God's sight. The Hebrew word behind the phrase in Exodus chapter 2, verse 2, and that is no ordinary child, is merely the typical word for good. The king's edict initially stated that all newborn Hebrew boys were to be killed in Exodus chapter 1, verse 16, and I quote this edict. When you are helping the Hebrew women doing childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see that the baby is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, let her live. And so when this edict was disobeyed by the midwife, the pharaoh, which is the king, required that every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw it into the Nile River. And so that comes from Exodus chapter 1, verse 22, and I quote, Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. Every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw him into the Nile but let every girl live. And so the baby Moses was put into a waterproof ark before being cast into the Nile River. And so technically Moses' parents, Jochebed and Aram, um, Jochebed and Aram, Amran, was obeying the king's command. And so now our writer to the book of Hebrews in chapter 11 continues on with others in verse 32 that are considered the the, the, uh, in the hall of faith. And so let's read verse 32 together, which is on our screen. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, and David and Samuel and the prophets. And so now in verse 32, these examples of faith continue through the centuries of the Old Testament scripture uh, and continue through what is called the hall of faith. The story of Gideon is found in Judges chapter 6 verses through chapter 8. Gideon served as a judge from 8, 11, I'm sorry, from 1192 BC to 1152 BC. Gideon is most notable for his 300 man force defeating the Midianite the Midianite huge army. Barak, a contemporary of Deborah, who judged from 1239 B.C. to 1199 B.C., raised an army to defeat the Canaanites in Judges chapter 4. 
Samson also served as a judge from 1075 B.C. to 1055 B.C. Samson's opposition to the Philistine is found in Judges chapters 13 through 16. <clears throat> the leadership of Jephthah against the Ammonites is recorded in Judges chapters 11 and 12. Jephthah judgeship extended from about 1086 B.C. to 1080 B.C. The extensive record of David, who reigned from 10 to, uh, 10 to 970 B.C., which was 40 years, runs from 1 Samuel chapter 16 through 1 King chapter 2. The ministry of Samuel, who is pivotal for being the last of the judges, and the first of the prophets is found in 1 Samuel chapter 1, uh, verse 1 through 25. And so these individuals of faith were not faultless. None of those was faultless. As a matter of fact, no one is faultless other than Jesus. Because the Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's why we needed the Savior, the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God, to come and to sacrifice his life as a ransom for many, so that all who believe in him can be saved. And so now let's look at our third outline, which is, has to do with promises because of faith. As we read from Hebrews chapter 11, verses 39 through 40 of the New International Version of the Bible. And so let's read our first subtopic of our third outline, which has to do not receive in verse 39. And so let's read verse 39. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. And so we see in verse 39 that Hebrews chapter 11, verse 39, repeats the thoughts of Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13, but in a condensed form. The word translated, were all commended, is the same as that in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 2, carrying the idea of having being witnessed, doing something through faith, since the faith of those considered looked ahead to the arrival of Jesus which did not come about in their lifetime. None of them received what had been promised, and that was the promise of a Messiah or that one would come one day down through the lineage of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and that would be God's eternal king that would sit on David's throne. We can contrast that with Matthew chapter 13 in verses 16 and 17. But they still had faith nonetheless. And so now we see our next verse, which has to do with verse 40 of Hebrew chapter 11, because God had something perfect planned for them. And so let's read verse 40. Since God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. And so we see in verse 40 that the phrase God had planned something better is the promise fulfilled in the earthly mission of Christ. Both we and they, and we're talking about those that are listed in Hebrew chapter 11 in this hall of faith, are made perfect in Christ's suffering, which we see in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 11, as well as Hebrews chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, and Hebrews chapter 7, verse 28. And so the word therefore really begins or introduces the next verse, which is Hebrew chapter 12, verse 1. And I quote Hebrew chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangle us. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. And so the writer of the big book of Hebrews prepares the reader to relate the Old Testament hall of fame to themselves because we too are running a race of faith. Our life is examples and should be examples 
of our faith and our trust in God, whom we have not seen, but we have confidence that he exists. Because the Bible says uh, that without faith, it is impossible to please God. And so let's close our lesson study today with this conclusion. The faith of imperfect people, which are we. We are imperfect people. Is there anyone that you can think of that's perfect? No, not one other than Jesus Christ. And so let's read our conclusion. The writer of the book of Hebrews selected some very faithful people as examples. People who also had some significant imperfection. We are to walk faith and not sight, as Paul would write in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. And this should be easier for us than for the Old Testament luminaries. They live with the cross and resurrection as accomplished facts in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 12. But although we are privileged to see much more of God's plan fulfilled, some promises remain to be fulfilled, such as a resurrected body that we will receive one day, a new heaven that we will enter one day, a new earth that will exist one day, and etc. All things that God has promised his people who by faith continue to obey and to trust in him. Many times we must make decisions without being able to see their results. A faith-based decision is based on believing the promises of God and determining to do what God has called you to do, regardless of how it might look in your eyes or the eyes of others. May the Holy Spirit empower us to do so. And so we close our lesson with this thought to remember. Faith overrides imperfection. Paul would write in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, that we live by faith and not by sight. So let's close with prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for today's study. As we have looked in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, and we have read briefly about those that were in the so-called hall of faith that put their trust and their faith in God concerning the promises that he made, even though they did not see the fulfillment of these promises. We too, Father, have been made promises by God that in Jesus Christ we are made right with you and that in Jesus Christ, Father, we will all one day be united and to live forever and ever in eternity. Thank you, Father, for Jesus. Thank you for his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection, and his ascension back into heaven, and the coming of the Holy Spirit, and to fulfill the promises that you have made throughout your word. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. Thank you for your participation. I pray God will continue to bless and keep you safe. Have a great day, and I pray that you will receive all the blessings of God throughout the coming new year, or throughout this year, the 2024. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.